I've got a huge smile on my face because I want to welcome all of you to the Kelly Cardenas podcast. And on today's show, very seldom do we have royalty, but we have royalty in our midst. Um, this young man has been in the life coaching space, which I think a lot of times people don't understand what the word means. Uh, but for me, I love when a person's a coach when they're actually a master at what they do. And there's very few masters, I believe, in this world because they've dedicated their whole entire life to mastering the craft that they do. And this man is synonymous. He is honestly, like, I don't have many hairdressers on the, on the podcast, as you guys know, but when I do, it's, it's absolute royalty. And that's what we're in the midst of today. Um, he, he go, I asked him what his title is and he said, I mean, he's a humble guy. He said, coach. Um, he, he, he's the founder of the journeyist, which he made up that word too. Um, so, but the reason why I'm so enamored with him as a coach and why I endorse him 100% is because I know of his mastery of his craft. There are so many people out there that will say, hey, I'm a coach, but they never could do it, so they were teaching it. This guy went out and did it, and oh, by the way, then he turns around and helps people along on their journeys. I've been taken back by this man for my whole entire career. Um, I've been around him. Uh, he's not the guy who's going to shout, jump up and down and, you know, be in your face, but he is the guy whose kind, direct words are going to impact you at an incredible level. And the crazy thing about it is what we're going to be talking about today is when he lost that thing that was probably one of the most valuable tools that he ever had which is voice, but in losing his voice, he actually found the voice that he was supposed to have in the first place. So my man, hair royalty, coaching royalty, Mr. Andrew Carruthers is going to be on the show. So let's get this party started. The man, the myth, hair royalty, life coaching royalty, just royalty in general, Mr. Andrew Carruthers. Welcome to the show, my man. Thank you, brother. It's it's such an honor to be here. And, um, you know, and everything that you said, which was so kind, it's, it's reflected back at you so much because um, I feel much the same way that you feel about me as soon as we connected. I was just like, you know. Kelly's good people and um I think you have naturally a, a maybe a brighter and bigger energy uh, into you like the, the, in the way that you communicate but not not in a way that has to steal the show which I always honored like you could be such a force on stage and such a huge presence but you didn't have to steal the show from anyone which is very different from uh, some of the others who um, we have shared stages with and so I always really appreciated that and when it when it came time to be off stage as soon as you stepped off stage that same presence came with you that same full presence and uh, when you would talk to me or you would talk to anyone we were the only person in that space so I I feel super honored to be here thank you so much for having me well, I love you, my man, and I have I have admired you um, from afar. And just the other day, I, I know exactly where I was. I was driving, and please don't judge me when you hear this, Andrew, but I was driving, and I happened to see a post on Facebook. Um, kids weren't in the car. Seatbelt was on, going slow. Okay. Mm -hmm. But I saw it. I read it. And... 
then God just put on my heart right then, call him. And I called you and I answered. Or you answered. Mm -hmm. What was the conversation for you? Mm -mm. Well, first, I'm so glad that I actually had you on my phone. <laughs> because when I saw your, your name come up on my screen, I was like, what the? Oh my gosh, this is awesome. And for those of you that are listening, um, I, I can't, I'm not even sure when the last time was that we, we had a face-to-face -face conversation or a person-to-person -person conversation. So when someone that you honor so deeply shows up on your phone after years and years, of course, it's a F yes, I'm picking up this call. So I picked up the call and it was just so beautiful to hear your voice. And, um, it's, it was great timing because yeah, I just had, um, put out that post about such a shift that I am, was making within the industry with it. And it took a couple of years to get to that place. But that post that I shared was that final moment of commitment to, I'm no longer hairdresser, Andrew at all. Mm -hmm. Like I will never teach hair again. I don't think I will. Let me, let me not say never because <laughs> there's always an opportunity to come out of the retirement at the right point. But as I shared that, it was so cool to have you be the first person to not just leave a comment on my Facebook page, not just leave a comment on my Instagram, but to actually pick up the phone and say, dude, tell me about this. What is happening? What is changing for you? I want to know more. And then we, of course, just had an incredible conversation and it led us to part of what we wanted to talk about today, which was about what had happened with my voice, which was hugely instrumental in this shift, in this transition from hair to coaching and facilitating and mentoring. Before we get into the loss of the voice and this, I mean, I tell you, if you're listening or watching right now, this journey that he's going to take you on is going to blow your mind. It's going to blow your mind. Um, before we do, a lot of people have gone through transitions or gone through, you know, the, the buzzword. And I even stayed away from the word. You know the word that's coming, the pivot. Like, oh, it's all about pivoting. It's all about, and people get a buzzword and then they try and use it all the time. But yeah. I got to see you truly, truly pivot. And it wasn't like you were trying to bring your last career with you and utilize your credibility, which you have the highest level. You just said, I want to go do this and I'm going to be okay being new in this space, but I'm not going to try and be like, yo, I threw four touchdowns in high school. Remember me? You just went into this new space and then you started mastering this new space. Can you talk about some of the tools that you had to have or some of the challenges that you went through to be able to do that? Because literally hairdresser Andrew could have said, hey, all the hairdressers in the world, this is what I'm going to do. Hmm. But you allowed your mastery to sit for a second while you went and did this other thing. Like that's strength to me. Well, thank you. Um, I, I will say this, that ev everything that I did experience and everything, everything that happened in that first um, 20, 23 years of my time within the hair industry, it did absolutely inform this, this pivot or transition. It was, it was a big shift for sure. Um, because I was known as the guy with a pair of scissors in my hands and to put that pair of scissors down and still want to show up in front of those audiences, but with a new message, with a fresh voice. Um, it was scary to be honest with you because that's not necessarily the reputation that I built. And in some ways, well, not in some ways, in a way, as I've started to refine who I am and what I'm doing as a coach and as a facilitator and as a mentor, um, I'm almost coming back to some of those roots because as I first transitioned, it did almost, it, it almost felt like I did need to kind of cut ties a bit. And I, and I, 
we'll, we'll kind of get into this as we talk about the voice stuff, but there was some trauma there, like true trauma that speaking of buzzwords, <laughs> but <laughs> there was some true trauma there with this industry. And so I, I did kind of depart. In fact, even like, I didn't want to say, well, I'm a coach to the hair industry. Um, I was really resistant to saying that I worked with hairdressers even because I wanted to depart so dramatically from that identity. And over the years, as that, as I worked through that trauma and as I started to allow that to shift and to come away, I'm not, I've actually found my way back to actually being quite clear that um, I love the hair industry and that it is part of my roots. And those 20 some odd years that I was a facilitator within the industry, that I did help to mentor others to be great facilitators and leaders within the industry. That's a big part of what I do lean into now. So it, I, you're right at first. It did almost feel like it, it wasn't just a pivot. It, it was almost a departure. Now coming back to it, it does feel more like a natural evolution mm -hmm. versus this grand departure. What gave you the strength to be able to do it? Because when you're known, I mean, for me, uh, again, you're royalty. Uh, you've always been royalty since the moment that I met you. I remember, you know, being, you know, seeing you and, and, you know, especially being in that Salt Lake area, it was like, I mean, you're the guy. And yeah. I remember the first time I really, what it hit me, it resonated with me, power couple for the first time. It was the article, you know, the article that I'm talking about. That yeah, was on the plaque I can't in believe you re remember that. Man. And that's I saw awesome. that plaque and I was like, man, that's something I aspire to do. Like, I don't even think I was married to my wife at the time, but I was like, man, when I have a wife, like, I want to have a power couple. Like, this was something that was massive to me. It was in Sugar House is where, yeah. where it was. But what gave you the permission to separate yourself from, like, because most of the time people gain an identity, they're so freaked out to step away from that identity. Yeah. Well, here's the truth. It, I wish it would have been courage. I wish it would have been power. Um, but it was fear, to be honest with you. It was, it was fear of what was happening to me on a physical, a mental, and spiritual level. Um, the pain had gotten so bad. I had almost completely lost my voice, the thing that has carried me in this industry for my entire career. Um, it, was, it was a sense of like, dude, you, you now have to trust this deep intuitive and spiritual message that you have been receiving for really two or three years now. You don't have a choice. This isn't even about courage anymore. This isn't even about confidence or any of those things. It's about you either need to do this or the pain is going to get even worse. The suffering is going to become even worse. And so it was a moment of escaping suffering, um, which I, even within my coaching, there, there's, there's two forms of motivation, right? Like we either are moving towards what we want or we're moving away from what we don't want. It's pretty much that simple. And there's always been this thing to me that I, I pictured that we should be motivated by the pursuit of what we do want. And I, and I still think that that's our highest power is to pursue that thing that is going to inspire us, to move us forward. But fear and pain and the escape of those things can be an incredibly powerful motivator, especially in times of weakness. And so I, I no longer look at it as something that's even bad. In fact, I think that for most of us, I think those of you listening, you can probably relate to this on some level where there were things in your life too, that you're like, oh, I want this so bad. My heart is pulling me forward. It's pulling me towards this thing. And yet some hidden agreement in the subconscious keeps you stuck. It keeps you there. And so God, universe, spirit, whatever you believe in comes along and says, Hey, um, 
I know for and about you something greater. So I'm going to hand you some pain. I'm going to hand you some suffering that will now turn into the motivation that you need to break this cycle, to get past this pattern. And so no longer do I see these moments of pain, these moments of suffering as, oh, well, that's bad motivation. Hmm? There's no good, bad, right or wrong. It moved me forward. It got me to do the thing that I couldn't do for myself in that moment based in in my courage or my confidence, because honestly, my courage and confidence was gone at that point. I didn't have it. So something else had to kick in. And at that moment, it was fear. And then that's what flipped the switch. How did it impact your relationship with your wife? Because as a man, we're, we're called to be confident. Um, Mm -hmm. most of the time our woman sees us as attractive when we're confident and we think it's because they think we're attractive because the way that we look, but we can look however we want, but if we're confident, we're good, but take us into those emotions that you have that the one tool. So if, I mean, you can imagine this, I mean, if you are, let me think. If you play the guitar and you're the baddest guitar player on the planet and all the guitars in the world are now not available to you, that's what it would be like. Take us into what you were feeling during that time and did it affect your relationship with your wife? Well, let, let me let me come back to something that, that you said, because yeah. I think this is super important, I, especially to the men out there. Um, this perception that what we should be or sa- how we need to be or have to be as men, it, it is so destructive for us. Like this is something we really have to find our way past. And if you have a great relationship with a good human, showing up vulnerably showing up honestly, that should be what's attractive, not false confidence. I'm I'm really fortunate, Kelly, because the woman that stands next to me, that's, that's what she's attracted to, is the real person inside of me. You know, being able to sit in front of her and share with her that I was terrified being able to have her sit next to me in my time of weakness and be the strength in my time of weakness. That's a great relationship. That's what we should be looking for. Not trying to attract a mate through some false bravado and this peacock chest, a man, um, you know, I will take care of everything. That's, that's the old, that's the old paradigm. We're shifting that as men. So that being said, I was so fortunate because not only did she stand by me, she became my support system. She, she loved me even more because I was able to share this with her. And don't get me wrong, all that bullshit of the past of like what a man should be um, as much work as I've done for myself. You better believe that was still sitting in my subconscious. You better believe that um, that fear was still in the back of my mind of, well, I can't let Michelle see me this way. I, I can't be weak. I can't be, you know, all of these things. And to your to your point, it's like it did feel like oh my gosh, I'm, you know, I'm this guitarist and that's what I've built this, this entire persona around and someone cut off my hands. So now who am I? Who will I be? How will I attract other humans? Because the thing that I thought they were attracted to, because Kelly, one of, one of the comments that I would get from my audiences is how much they loved my voice. I would get comments on, I love when you teach because I, I love the pace. I love that you aren't loud. I love that you talk to us in a way that we can relate to. You take these concepts that are really big and, and really overwhelming 
and you transform them into something that we can digest. That's what I kept hearing throughout my career. So of course, my belief system is that's my relationship to others is my voice. And so everything was riding on it. And so to start to lose that ability to speak, yeah, it brought up every insecurity, every fear, every doubt. Um, yeah, it, it rocked my world, but I, and back to your question with my wife, man, she, she stood, she stood next to me like a rock. Well, it's incredible for me because for me, you guys were the original couple that I looked up to. I never told you this, um, but seeing you two, um, cause I remember meeting her and she has a, a rock star quality to her, not in a, you know, that she's dressed a certain way, whatever it is, but she had that rock star quality. And then uh, we were talking and she mentioned your name. Well, I didn't know you guys were married at the time. And she mentioned your, she said, you know, my husband or whatever it was. And, and then I realized, and I was like, I, I get it. Like, you know, so I want to, I want to compliment you on that. Um, when you talk about losing your voice this was this was incredible to me when we had the conversation because I was thinking, oh, when you first said I lost my voice, I was like, oh, I've lost mine too, Andrew. Um, mm. You know, I've had a cold. <laughs> you know, one time I tried to catch a surfboard, which was so stupid. The wave was coming and I went to go catch it and I just put off my hands like this and the board went above and hit me in the throat. And I lost my voice for a couple of days. Mm -hmm. No big deal. I whispered and then I moved on. Yours was completely different for a completely different reason. Can you take us down that rabbit hole? Because this one blew my mind. Yeah. In 2019, I, I took a position with, with the company that I was working for. Um, it's a company within the hair industry called Sam Via. And Sam is just a wonderful human being. Just, you want to talk about freaking royalty, dude, just a saint. Um, and I, I had worked with Sam for six, yeah, six years at this point, seven years at this point. And throughout that point, I had been a platform artist for him and his artistic director. And in 2019, the guy that was kind of my direct report within our company, he left the company and went to do other things. And the, the thought of um, potentially me stepping into his role started to come up and I was like, you know, I, I think this is a step I want to take. Now this, this was a step a little bit more into the world of, um, we'll, we'll just kind of give it a title of like corporate life, you know, like corporate business life, you know, clocking in at nine o'clock in the morning clocking out at the end of the day, having meeting meetings about sales and marketing and this type of stuff. And I was still the, the, artistic contribution to that world, but I had never had this kind of job. I've been a hairdresser all my life. Yes, we have appointments that we have to show up for at a certain time and we go home at a certain time, but there was never this much structure and this much sitting in front of a, a Zoom screen and being in meetings. And, um, and at first it was really interesting. I was super curious. It came with a great pay raise, let's be honest. And so the first month or two, I was like, this is really cool. I'm enjoying this. About four months into it, things started to shift and I started to like not really want to show up. I found myself not wanting to log in for the Zoom meetings. And then I would log in for the Zoom meetings and I wouldn't speak, I wouldn't talk. And when I would, uh, 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 all, this, all, all of a sudden I was pushing through to, to, to get some words out. I was like, what is this? Like I've never, ever, this is the first time in my entire life I've ever experienced this. So it was really confusing to me. So I started to look at my diet I started to look at, am I drinking too much, you know? Am I not sleeping well? Is there some type of bacteria growing in our house? Like, is is our water infected with some kind of virus? I looked at every kind of physical contribution that could possibly be happening. And it just kept getting worse. 
I mean, to the point that I'd be sitting in these meetings, um, and the meetings were the worst. During these meetings, I would just have to force myself, and it sounded terrible. It started to show up then in the, even the content I was creating because I was still creating content for our YouTube channel. And the first time this really freaked me out, Kelly, is the a woman that watched a lot of our YouTube comment con content said this comment. She was like, is Andrew okay? He sounds terrible. I still remember that moment because it was, it was like soul crushing to me that in the place that I do still have passion, which was teaching and sharing, even though I was starting to lose, lose my passion for the content, which is hair, I still loved to teach. And so to have someone that had watched all of our videos and a, a fan say, what's wrong with Andrew? that was the moment, dude, I was just like, holy shit, what is going on here? And so I went to an ear, nose and throat doctor. I was like, Oh, I can see that your vocal cords are a little rough, you know, from you straining. But other than that, there is nothing physically wrong with you. I went to a naturopathic doctor. You look healthy to me and nothing's going on. Like maybe kind of cut back on the caffeine, cut back on, you know, the inflammatory things within your diet. But really no one could figure out any kind of physical reason for this to be happening to me. And so that's luckily where I was able to learn, lean into more my spiritual practices, my emotional practices, and it really started to become clear that this had nothing to do with any kind of physical ailment, it had nothing to do with the water supply, it had nothing to do with allergies. Oh, I also went and got a bunch of a whole panel of allergy tests because again, I thought, well, maybe this is potentially what's happening. So through all of that, no physical reason for my throat to be closing. Like I said, I was able to come back to my spiritual practices, the things that I do for myself emotionally, and really started to recognize like, it's about this choice to step into a place where your voice is not supposed to be heard. Um, and please know this, this is not, this is not in any way a uh, judgment on the people that were sitting in that boardroom with me on the zoom. But it, it was it was quite a few people with very loud voices, their their natural personality is to be the first person to speak to, you know, be really quick to respond. I'm not that person. If you know anything about the disc profile, I'm very much a C, like I wait to respond, I th very thought thought oriented, I want to think things through, give me time and space to respond. There just wasn't really that much space at that boardroom table for someone like me. And I'm trying to use my voice for things I don't care about. I don't have passion about I didn't, I really had no passion about marketing and sales. Not that they weren't important, but that wasn't my personal passion. So it started to become clear that using my voice at these tables that it didn't feel welcome using my voice to talk about things that I had no passion for, it started to become pretty clear that this was what was happening. How, how do you reconcile that? Like, I mean, and how thankful were you for it? Because there's a lot of people right now that are listening or watching that are straining their voice and maybe it's not happening physically but they're straining their voice in something that they shouldn't be doing. And they're beating their head against the wall. My, my brother said it to me one time. He said, your greatest attribute is also the thing that will bring you down. And I said, well, what are you talking mm. about? He said, you stay in the ring too long. And I was like, what do you mean? He said, you don't know when to throw in the towel because you don't know how to throw in the towel. And I was like, yeah, but that's yeah. a badge of honor. He said, no, that's what will get your butt kicked. Mm -hmm. So what about the, like how, what's a sign of this without, I mean, you were so blessed to get a physical sign. There's a lot of people that 
aren't getting fit. Maybe it's an emotional sign in a relationship, whatever it was. If you're coaching someone and they're starting, uh, what are some of the signs that they can see that maybe they're using their voice in a place they shouldn't be using it? My friend Carlo always says this thing. He said, God will speak to you in ways that he knows that you will hear it. So this is where we have to become more attentive. We have to pay closer attention to what is happening around us. Because what, what God, spirit, universe, whatever you like to call it, knew for me is to get Andrew to really understand what is happening here. We have to take the thing that he identifies with most, his voice. We have to go there. For someone else, it might be... Uh, you know, gastrointestinal, gastrointestinal issues, um, which gut intelligence is very much about sense of self. You know, people are like, oh man, you know, my guts just haven't been good for the last couple months. Well, of course, the first thing that we look at again is food, um, you know, alcohol, everything that we're consuming and putting into the stomach. But the stomach is also where we digest our world. It's, it's our sense of self. It's our integration. And so if a client comes to me and they're saying, yeah, I've, I've had really bad gut issues or things like that. It's like, okay, what are we not paying attention to about the sense of self? What are we not digesting? What are we not open to? And so it's becoming more aware of not just happening what's happening up here in the head space, but what's happening within the rest of the body. Because the physical body will respond to there's intelligence throughout every cell of our body. But we, we have become so reliant on the head brain. And so for me, the head brain was going, but you're so lucky to have this position, man. Like, look at this. You know, you work for this great company. It's a position that so many people in our industry would you know, give everything to have, you're making a great living, you work with great people, what could possibly be wrong with you? That's the head brain. That's the logic brain. Even though deep in my heart, my heart was just screaming at me like, dude, this is not what you're passionate about. Deep in my gut, it was, you know, I was actually having gastrointestinal, gastrointestinal issues at that point. And um, I was losing weight, even though I was eating plenty. And yeah, it, it, my whole body really was telling me, this is not right. You're not in the right place. And so again, I think what God, Spirit, Universe knew for me was, okay, what we have to do to actually get you to pay attention here is we have to go to something that's so sensitive to you, that's so dear to you we've got to take your voice. That's the only way that we're going to get you to pay attention here. So how that turns into maybe some advice for the rest of you out there listening is don't brush these things off. If you're in pain in your body, if something is disrupted within your body, if you are getting these signs, please do not brush them off as just bad luck. You know, um, influences from external environment like really be open and aware that spirit and body and whatever it is is trying to get your attention what argument did you have with God during this time? Because I, I think that that's a part that a lot of people won't expose because they're like we always hear the lesson afterwards like Andrew lost his voice, right? Mm. Um, in losing his voice, he found his real voice. And now that's mm. where we move forward. And you, it's almost like that, that movie of like the feel good part of it. But they don't sit in for a second. Like when we lose the voice, what's the argument, if any, that you had with God? Like, are you kidding me right now? I mean, did you go through any of that stuff or... Were you just the master sage that, that I know you to be? What was no. the argument? This, this is a great question, Kelly. Um, so for me, my, my relationship is with, I, I call it spirit. It's just the oneness of, of all that is. 
And so um, I'm a very spiritual human. I have daily practices that um, I'm pretty committed to. And so, yeah, absolutely. There was this moment of like, okay, spirit, what the hell is going on right now? <laughs> like, really? I, I show up every morning on my yoga mats. I show up every morning in my meditation. And, um, you know, I, I do my rituals and really, this is, this is what we're going to do now. Okay, cool. Fortunately, a big part of my belief system has kind of always been that the obstacles that are placed in front of us are for our highest and greatest good. Um, it was hard to accept that in that moment. So there was definitely some arguments happening there. Fortunately, in my moments of clarity, which weren't all the time, but in my moments of clarity, I was able to come back to that place of, okay, it's, it's about acceptance right now. Because the more I try to fight with it, it's a losing battle because it's here for a reason. So I can, you know, I can put on the boxing gloves and I can um, do what, what a lot of us are told to do in this society is like when the going gets, you know, rough, the tough get going kind of thing. Um, I can try to go that way or I can step back and go, okay, what is here for me right now? What can I step into acceptance of instead of into fight with? Um, cause yeah, the, uh, I'll tell you, man, absolutely. The first response was like, what really? Like I'm, I'm living a good life. I'm doing good things. I'm, you know, doing my morning meditations. I'm doing all of this and really you're going to take my voice. But that, that's, that was part of the lesson here is trust because I, I will tell you, Kelly, at this point, I'm grateful for this experience it, and it still affects me to, to this day. You guys, as you're listening, you probably hear every once in a while, my voice will kind of just kind of get a little rough or like, it'll kind of clip off a little bit at the end of a sentence or something. So this is still something I'm dealing with to this day. And I wouldn't change anything because to your point, Kelly, this is what led me to this place that I'm so passionate about supporting other people with this. And you know, as well as I do, there's not a facilitation course in the world right now, not at least in our world that we've been in, that actually talks about how to take care of your voice, how to, how to actually speak from a place that isn't going to destroy your vocal cords, how to actually find the authenticity within yourself as you step in front of other humans. That's not what facilitation courses are about, especially within our industry. It's about how to stand on stage and how to deliver a message and how to build your lesson plans and, you know, how to get your crowd interactive, which are all essential, but they're tools of the trade. The heart of what we do is what's coming from inside of us. And that part is missing within facilitation. And that's a big part of my passion now. The only reason I'm, I'm having this passionate moment is because of my experience. I had to go through this. And if it would have been, you know, just a drop, a pebble in the pond, it wouldn't, it wouldn't have woke me up. How does a person get in touch with their heart? The simple answer is start paying attention. Like it's, it's literally as easy as you can do it right now. So if right now you just take a couple of breaths for yourself, just a nice gentle breaths in and out through your nose and just let your attention rest on that space that when you say, my heart is telling me this, Rest your attention in that space. And you don't need a message right now. Just how does it feel? Does it feel tight? Does it feel open? Does it feel warm? Does it feel cold? Is there texture to it? Is there a vision of what that space looks like? And just by bringing attention and awareness to this space, it reactivates 
that connection that we have to that intelligence. Um, your, your heart actually has as many neurons as like many small animals do in their head brain. And it is actually scientifically proven at this point that we are receiving messages from this organ within our chest we call the heart. There, there is actually more information coming from the heart going to the head than vice versa. We can see that. So the heart, not only on a figurative level or on a spiritual level has intelligence, but now we know it on a scientific level, it actually has intelligence. Again, one of the greatest ways that we can get in touch with that intelligence is just reconnecting to that space within us. And that's through awareness. Now, if, if you think about the linguistic cues that, that we give ourselves, what do we say about the heart? We say, oh, my heart is telling me this. And usually what we're talking about is some level of compassion, empathy, connection, um, something that is really important to us that we value really highly. If we listen to those linguistic cues, now we have those cues to, well, what could be, what could we look to from the heart to get information about? So when we need information about compassion, empathy, connection, values, just resting attention in the heart and just getting in touch with it. It's as simple as that, honestly. I want to take you through a couple of scenarios. Number one, I had to put my glasses on because we went into that intellectual part of the podcast. <laughs> so I wanted to make sure, Andrew, that That's I right. came back. You know what I'm saying? That I came back with yeah. it. You look sexy and I'm going to tell Thank you, you that. I appreciate it, man. Can you tell my wife uh, if you could if you could do that? That would be great. Uh, yep, it would, I'll text it would her later. help me a lot. Um, there's a couple of sayings, and I think that for me, you're the example of this. I heard a person say the other day, um, they said, just go with the flow. And I sat in it for a second, and then I responded, but be conscious of the river you're in. Mm -hmm. And he's like, well, what do you mean? And I said, well, I live near Mexico. So if I got in the river that's right down in San Ysidro, that's filled with raw sewage, it, within <laughs> less than a mile, I'd die. But I'd mm -hmm. be going with the flow. And then someone said the other day, <laughs> trust your gut. And I said, as long as you know what you're putting in it. Mm -hmm. And you, the reason why I say you're an example of this is because when you say tap into your heart, you are also have been a person that as long as I've known you, you've actually invested in that organ. You've mm -hmm. invested in that part. So sometimes when a person wants to trust what their heart is saying, but they haven't spent any time on their heart, or if they say go with the flow, but, but they're not taking any, you know, conscious decisions of which river they step into. What, yeah. what is your take on that? I, w I love this, this question because this is so important because when we do say like, oh, you really got to trust in your heart or, oh, you got to really trust in your gut. If it's giving you healthy input, which is exactly what you're saying, healthy input from the gut, healthy input from the heart, healthy input from the head, healthy input from the nervous system requires that we have fed it good, healthy things too. It has to be that way. Just like the mind, the head brain, not the mind, but the head brain, just like the head brain can mislead us, it can also be our greatest ally. Because if it is in good health, if it is sharing beautiful information with us. It can be our greatest ally. I mean, how many of you out, out there, I wish I could see your hands because I think most of them would go up. <laughs> how many of you out there also have some real poisonous thoughts on a regular basis about who you are, what you are? So if we're feeding the brain negativity, if we're feeding it negative thoughts, and this is usually happening unconsciously, Kelly, it's, 
our obsession with our phone. It's our obsession with bad news. It's our obsession with things that um, we don't rec- realize are feeding poison into us. But if we are consistently feeding that to an organ within our body on a regular basis, you better believe it's going to be put poison back into our body. It's the same principle with our heart. If our heart is unwell, it is not going to guide us in a healthy way. The, the, the body really responds from its needs. Um, so if, if my heart's need is love, if my heart's need is connection, if it's an unhealthy heart, it will find what it believes is love and connection in unhealthy places. It's why we find ourselves in unhealthy relationships is if our pattern and our previous experiences have let our body believe that that is where we will get that need met. It's where it's going to continue to be hungry for that feed, that food. It's the same thing with the gut. If I'm continually feeding myself things that are not good for me, but you know, we need the nutrients. So even if it's McDonald's every single day for two years, that's still where we're getting our nutrients from. So of course, when the gut gets hungry for nutrients, what's it going to crave? It's going to crave McDonald's. It's not going to crave salad. That's not what's going to happen. Our body is based in pattern and habit. And so It has needs and it's going to get those needs met where the pattern and habit has always existed. So if our thoughts are patterned and habited and patterned into a certain thought process, if our heart is patterned into a certain way of looking for its need of connection, if the gut is patterned into how it gets its nutrients, we're, we're going to propel naturally unconsciously towards those, those needs. What do you say to the person that is out there? Listen, I was just, uh, just spoke to a company the other day and this young lady really touched my heart. She said, you know, I've lived my whole life and my mom has told me that I'm basically garbage. Mm -hmm. Um, and she, and I said, well, how long you been working here at this company? Cause that company is one of the best in the industry. And I know that they have a culture of lifting people up. She said about six months. And she said, since I've started working here, I have been lifted up. I've been encouraged, all these things. She was like, but I find myself sliding back into what my mom told me. And I I just asked her, well, how long have you been alive? She said, 18 years. I said, well, if you had 18 years of training here and six months of training here, how could you expect the six months to override the 18 years? And she was like, well, how do I overpower that because I'm only 18 years old. How would a person start on that journey, Andrew? The, the challenge is, once again, this comes back to something that we talked about earlier. The challenge is what we've been taught in our society is that we have to overpower it, that we have to fight, that we have to um, kill the other thing so that this other thing can be true. That's a big challenge within our society. Now, your your question to her was i think the most perfect question you could ask because to your point those habits and patterns um i like to think of them as rivers you know back to this this go with the flow analogy if we're talking about the colorado river which has existed for i don't even know how long but it's existed for a damn long time this isn't a trickle of water this is a well-established pathway that's dug deep into the trenches of earth. Now, if a farmer digs a small trench to irrigate the field and there's a trickle of water going through it, that's going to be pretty easy for mother nature to just rain pretty hard and that trench is going to disappear. No big deal. Colorado River is going to require a little bit more influence (laughs) to redirect. (laughs) And so to your point, if I have been thinking these thoughts, if I have been repeating these patterns, um, most neuroscientists agree that 
somewhere between the range of 60 up to 90% of our thoughts are the exact same thoughts that we had the day before, because 90% of our day is lived in our subconscious mind. If I have repeated those patterns, repeated those thought processes, repeated those stories that mom told me for the last 19 years, that's the Colorado River in my mind. It is going to take a lot of days, a lot of months, a lot of years, potentially. Uh, it might, it might even be good to accept that it, it could be a lifetime that this affects us because it's in the struggle. This is one of the things that the Buddha taught that I think is so valuable. And by the way, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not attached you're, to any you're specific good. religion. You're good. Um, but the Buddha taught that our greatest source of suffering is our lack of acceptance of just the way things are. It's we want to fight, we want everything to change, we have to have it different, we have to have it a certain way. And so we're causing so much internal suffering. So if we can step into a place that it's like, oh, I accept that after 19 years, this is something that is dug deep into the trenches of my mind. And it is going to take time, patience, some self love, some rough nights, all of those things to get to a place that it doesn't feel that way all the time. If I can accept that, the fight disappears. Some of the suffering that is self inflicted starts to disappear and it releases a space that those things can now process that we can actually do something with them. But if we have a stranglehold on the process, like I need it to happen tomorrow, I don't want to ever think this thought, thought again, we actually create more resistance within the process. So if we step into acceptance and say, and by the way, acceptance is not, it's not a permission. Acceptance is definitely not an approval of that. This is good, bad, right, or wrong. Acceptance is just a state of, I understand that this is the way things are because of what I have experienced in my life. That's acceptance. And then with acceptance, we can actually start to do something with these things. If we're still in resistance with it, it's really tough to do anything with it. Everyone out there that's watching, listening, you know exactly why I wanted to spend time with this guy. Um, I watched a, a documentary. I'm sure that you've seen it. It's called Euro Dreams of Sushi. Oh, I and, love it so um, much. I knew you would love it because who I think about with that movie is you. Um, you didn't have to. Everyone says it today. Like, I got to have this social presence. I got to have, I got, I have to do all these things. This is what I hear business say, uh, owners say all the time. I have to, I hate it, but I have to do it because if I'm doing the right thing, but no one knows, it's as if I'd never did it. Mm. But Euro Dreams of Sushi said the other way. He said, masters, if you become a master at your craft, the world will find you. They found him in a very small subway sushi restaurant that's not white glove, but yet you can't get a, a, a reservation there for years and upon years upon years, and especially after the documentary, good luck on that one. Mm -hmm. but you in my mind depict that like you've always been a master of your craft not worrying about the shine not worrying about any of those things but there's very few people who have just dedicated themselves to wanting to be the greatest at what you did not in comparison to anybody but just because you honored that craft whatever it was how does a person start their journey to become a master? <laughs> well, I want to first recognize that I love how you see me. <laughs> um, I, I truly do. And I, I just honor it so much. And one of, one of the things that makes my heart happy about how you see me is that some of the internal work that I was doing through this entire process 
it was working. Because let's be real, you better believe that there were plenty of moments where the ego, the want to be the star, the want to be the person that was cooler, better, or stronger, whatever than everyone else. We all have that peace within us. Some of it, some of us, our peace is larger or stronger, and some of us, it's not as, as um, substantial, but we all have that peace within us. You better believe that there were moments, Kelly, that in, as you saw me on stage thinking, wow, man, this guy's really humble and he's really just like doing it because he loves the craft. There were, there were definitely times that there was also an influence of, well, I want to show up and be the coolest, be the best. Cause I didn't really have that a lot growing up. I, I was, I always wanted to be the, the really cool punk rock kid, but um, my disposition didn't allow me to be the cool punk rock kid because I didn't want to be a punk ass, you know, like I didn't want to hurt people. I didn't want to punch people. I didn't want to scream in their faces. Um, in fact, I was usually the kid that was breaking up the fights at the punk rock show. So I was never the cool kid in the punk rock scene, but I always wanted to be. So there was absolutely a place as I started to get some stardom within the hair industry and some respect, you better believe that 13, 14 year old kid that always wanted to be the cool kid in the punk rock scene, he started to show up. And so in my work, and again, coming back to my wife, I'm so blessed to have a relationship with her that she called me back in a couple of times. Like, hey man, that thing that you just said, that comparison that you just made, is that your ego speaking? And she called me back in. I'm really blessed to have someone like that that can do that for me. So I just wanted to say that because, like, again, I love the reflection of how you saw me. Because what's encouraging about that is the work that I was doing behind the scenes to make sure that that piece of me was honored because it's still a piece of me yet it wasn't it wasn't what was standing in front of the audience that was happening behind the scenes so to your question i think that that's a big part of this if you want to become a master we do have to step into awareness of what is calling me to mastery is it my ego that's calling me towards mastery is it an expectation of what I might have or what I might get or the reward I might, you know, reap in that moment of mastery? Or is, is it a deeper heart, gut, spirit aspect of me that is drawing me forward um, to your, you know, example of, of the movie? You know, he, he wasn't motivated by being a famous sushi chef. That, that's not why he mastered his craft. He did it because he was drawn to it. On what seemed honestly to be a, a spiritual level. And so I think that's one of the big first steps. If, if you are called towards, well, I want to become a master at this thing. It's first checking in. What, what is that call? And by the way, if it's, I want to stand in front of millions of people, there's nothing wrong with that either. We just have to check in with what am I wanting from standing in front of millions of people? Can you have it all, Andrew? Because most of the time we hear or see, we see the, the master that shuns the stuff. And a lot of times from an outside perspective, sometimes we'll shun even blessing coming in because they're like, no, I'm just about the mastery. Then we have the other side that they got a mm, thought of mastery, but they marketed the hell out of it and milked it for every single thing. So those are the, the, the both sides of the spectrum, right? Sure. Yeah. Can you have it both? I, I think that we can we can find harmony somewhere in between those two points. Yes, I do. 
I, I, I feel like it's what I'm trying my best to find um, right now is that harmony. Because I, I am, once again, starting to get some traction. That's a good way to put it. I'm starting to get some traction within my business in a really beautiful way. The ego gets hungry. It says, <laughs> oh man, you could take on 10 new clients and you could have this if you did that. Oh, you could travel two or three times a month instead of just once a month. Oh, you could have X, Y, Z. And at this point, I recognize that there's always a compromise. Um, this is one thing I don't think that we can have at all. Um, because when, when we say we can have it all, I, th I think that it comes from a perfectionistic standpoint that, you know, I can work 60 hours, 70 hour work weeks and still have time for my kids and still have time for meditation or prayer. I can still have time for my community. I can still have time for my spouse. Now we're starting to talk about unrealistic expectations. So. I think we can have harmony. I don't know that we can have it all. I want to go back. I want to rewind a little bit because you, you mentioned something, but I want to dive into it because we grew up, my whole family's from Salt, oh, well, when I say Salt Lake, outside of Salt Lake, people in Salt Lake are going to be like, your family wasn't from Salt Lake because they're from Tooele. <laughs> Right. Okay. And so yeah, that's when a whole I say different world out there. exactly. So but when I tell people to Willa they that don't live in Salt Lake or Utah, they're like, where's that? And I'm like, Salt Lake, you know, so to all my Salt Lake people and we got a house now in Park City. So I, I mean, I'm there with you. I love you. You're my people. My family's from Tooele. From those of you outside of Utah. My family's from Salt Lake <laughs> or a little town outside Salt Lake. But you said something about punk rock. Why is punk rock so important in Salt Lake? And the reason why I cannot wait for you to meet my cousin, Jeremy, my cousin, Jeremy, and you, you have a very similar spirit, soft-spoken, super wise, amazingly intellectual, but punk rock as they come, man. Hmm. What a great question. Cause, um, my friend Yurish Hooker, who is also an educator within the hair industry and just a brilliant, brilliant man, um, he lived the punk rock life in New York, like the hardcore punk rock life, like the drugs, the fights, the everything. Um, and we were, we were together this past week in Guatemala for our friend uh, Carlo's wedding, Carlo and Yoshi. And we got to talk in, in depth about this because I, I expressed to him, I was like, you know, I always kind of wanted to be in that punk rock kid. Like I wanted to be the one in the fights. Like, you know, I wanted to be like real hard and yet it just isn't me. It's not who I am. And he kind of asked me a similar question. He's like, well, what, what were you attracted to within this? And I think what is, what is so essential about a movement like punk rock is it is the voice that says we're we're not going to accept the popular opinion here just because it's the popular opinion we're not going to go with the flow when the flow is a poisoned river we're going to create our own and when we do it we're not going to allow you to not pay attention either so we're going to make it loud. We're going to make it in your face. We're going to make it crazy so that you have to pay attention. And I think that that is what is so incredibly powerful within a movement like punk rock or, you know, like gangster rap, whether you agree or disagree, or like it or not, that shit caught your attention. They said, Hey, you know what? Here's what's happening in our world. And you're not going to not hear about it. And we're not in agreement of how you think it should be handled. So in a town like Salt Lake City that, you know, grew up with a pretty strong hand on it of the church, of the expectations, 
there was a group of people, a large group of people there that were like, we don't agree. This is not okay with us. The way you want us to live our life? Absolutely not. And so you, you see that uprising in many places that kind of have a culture that's really, really strong in a different direction. And, and no shade on the church, you know, it is what it is, but that's what that punk rock movement was coming up against is, okay, here's the overwhelming majority of how you are telling us how we should be, what we believe, what we should believe, what we should say, how we should act. And, you know, we're not going to do that. We're, we're going to do the exact opposite and we're going to do it so loud and so in your face that you can't not pay attention to it. Who is Andrew Carruthers? Hmm. He is the punk rock hippie that has a passion for almost everything he touches. And I can finally say that in full acceptance because the jack of all trades master of none has um, always been kind of looked down upon. I've always been told that I was too hungry. I had, I had a, a spiritual mentor for a long time that just continually told me how I was this lost person searching for the answers. I'm absolutely not a lost person. I'm an explorer. I'm a curious hum human. I'm also the person that I want to be able to dress like an old school punk rock kid one day and then put on some like flowy shit the next day and be a total hippie. And there's nothing in conflict about that. And I can only say that now at 46 years old because I've gone through it enough. But yeah, it like who is Andrew Carruthers is that is a complex and long story, brother. And I, I'm finally able to embrace that because like I told you for a long time, what I wanted, and this happened both, you know, in those high school days, like I wanted to be identified as he's the cool punk rock kid. He's the great skateboarder. He's the bass player in that awesome punk rock band. I wanted to have an identity so bad that was clear that people could really point to. And that carried with me even into spirituality because there was a time that I was kind of looking for, well, I want, I want to be a something, but everything I was attracted to within spirituality wasn't really my place to call myself that, right? And so eventually as I continued to explore, I was like, oh, okay. I, I don't have to be a something. I can be the collector. I can be the explorer. I can be the journeyist. And here's something really beautiful, dude. This past week in Guatemala, one of the incredible things that we got to do is we got to sit in meditation on the top of a Mayan temple, looking out at Tikal, which is the, the Mayan civilization there in Guatemala. We got to sit there and watch the sunrise over the jungle and hear the howler monkeys welcome the sun. And dude, just something came over me um, that was so powerful. And just this voice came to me and it said, and you, you don't have to keep searching. You already know the truth. You have always known it. And it's exactly what we were just talking about is what that voice was telling me is the truth is, is you don't have to identify into this one narrow space. You can be the person that sits here in a Mayan temple one day and feels the influence of that Mayan culture. You can be the, the person that can sit in a church pew at the Baptist church and just weep as you hear these people sing their hymns. It's all true. It's always been true. It always will be true. That, um, and that, that confirmation was, was huge, huge. With someone right now trying to find their voice, or if you had a room full of them, 
what would you say to him? It's not going to happen today. Because I think one of the things that we have to have to step into acceptance with is that it is a journey and it will it will only be found through exploration i have tons of beautiful practices and processes and things that i can take you through that will open these doors 100% but none of those specific practices will actually say here is your voice. And that's going to be through the exploration, through the experiences, through the suffering that might come in those moments as you open the doors to darkness even. That's how we find our voice. So I think what I would say to people is just accept that it's not going to happen today. Take the resistance, take the wanting, take the hunger away so that you can actually enjoy this beautiful process we get to go through, which is called being human and living a human life. So yeah, I, I think that that's, that's where I would start. Andrew, you're a beautiful human being, man. I mean, there's, there, I've, I've been very fortunate because I have some really, really cool friends, you know, and I don't think I've ever told you this, but I'm going to force you to be my friend for the rest of your life. So the, the cool thing in that is I don't have to be in a rush with anything, but I, I could, <laughs> I could say this for every single person that, um, myself included, whether it be watching or listening, it's like, um, if I would have known that Michael Jordan was Michael Jordan at the time when I was watching him as a kid, there's mm -hmm. not a game that I would have missed. I missed a lot of games because mm -hmm. I didn't understand what I was experiencing. What I want the audience to understand is we're in the midst of that right now with you. And so what I would suggest is take note, listen, and try and experience as much as possible. I'm very fortunate because he's my friend and I'm going to sell his phone number uh, after this. I'm going to auction off his phone number for charity uh, at the end of the show. <laughs> I'm just joking with you, man. But I, uh, Andrew, I started the podcast because of my two kids, Maddox and McKenna. Maddox is 12 years old. Uh, McKenna is 15. I didn't want them worshiping idols um, because I was very fortunate to have such cool friends that I got to humanize all the idols that I had in my life. They, they would come in and I would think, wow, this person accomplished this. They're amazing. And then I'd get close to them and be like, oh, wow, it's a person. And I never wanted my kids to worship the idols. I wanted them to be inspired by icons like yourself. Mm. So what advice would you have for Maddox and McKenna? And if you could use both their names, it would be awesome. Mm. Maddox and McKenna, my advice to you is to find deep trust in all aspects of yourself. Find deep trust in your intuition. Find deep trust in your connection to spirit, to God. Find deep trust in the emotions that sometimes, yeah, they might be hard to, to feel. And sometimes it might even feel like they're fooling you. But there's something valuable there. Find trust in your physical body that, again, sometimes might even feel like it's failing you, that it hurts, that there's aches, there's pains. But if you can find trust that they're there for a reason, that leads us to be able to lead ourselves instead of needing to find idols in front of us to look to. So Maddox and McKenna, you got to freaking awesome dad and i think you can trust him too <laughs> andrew it is honestly it's been my it's been my pleasure man there when i was saying it um i didn't say and didn't finish my thought that because i have such cool friends i've been very fortunate to get closer to people and see them when i see them up close my good friends are actually even better up close. And I want to, I want to extend that to you. 
um, sometimes when you see someone from a distance, then you see them up close, you're like, ah, maybe I should move back a couple steps. Mm-hmm. But it seems like, you know, over the years, and we haven't got a chance to spend that much time together, but I, I want to force that as we move forward, that there is going to be more time. Um, but I want to compliment you, man, because experiencing you more and more, it's just like the, la- like, the, you know, the, the layers, they just keep getting better, man. And, uh, it, it's unbelievable. So wh- when is the, um, when's, when's the Andrew book, uh, coming to all of us? That's a good question. You, you actually asked me about it on our phone call too, if I was working on a book and, um, I, I have actually started, um, I'm in no rush because the, the book is, uh, part of what I had to realize about this book is it has nothing to do with my business. This is, this will be purely a passion project. It won't be to, you know, help me to establish my, you know, loftiness within my industry or any shit like that. Like that is not what this book is about. And again, let me be clear. There is that piece of me that's like, well, I want to be the guy that wrote a book and it's going to be a bestseller and all that stuff. I, I had to put all that to a side to the side. So there's no rush, um, but it is in the works and um, it'll be part memoir of experiences and part um, tools to help people on their path to finding their true self and their authentic self. Um, so, yeah. It'll happen when it, when it happens. Andrew, you're an incredible man. I want to thank you, honestly, for being on the show. For every single person out there watching, listening, I want to thank every single one of you guys who has been rocking with the podcast. Um, if you haven't subscribed, subscribe, because my son, if you, especially if you're on YouTube, because my son thinks I'm cooler if I have more <laughs> subs. <laughs> Help a brother out on Spotify. If you're listening on Spotify, just click the like follow button or the subscribe or whatever you, you, you think you need to do. Um, what I would suggest too, and I, I, and I don't ask for a lot, is I would ask you to share this with someone who's straining their voice right now, whether it be physically or literally, because I believe that Andrew is that master that the world is finding more and more each day. And if there's any way that I can help that, I want to, but I tell you, there's so many people out there that need to hear his voice. And so share it as much as possible. Andrew, you're an incredible, man. I, I applaud you. Um, I'm going to give you, I'll, I'll give you a, a, a standing O here in a second. All right. Um, you're, you're an unbelievable human being, man. And um, I want to tell you, I would love at some point to have you at the Vibe Room, which is a live version of the podcast. I, I do it in Salt Lake City, and I actually, we do this, but we do it in front of an audience of about 65, 70. We have musical artists that come in, and then the people get to know you in the audience, too, which I think would be amazing. Oh my gosh, that'd be amazing. Um, so you, you just tell me when. I'll be there. <laughs> More to come, but Andrew, you're officially off the hot seat.